fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Well, welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren and it's uh, a mean day today because it's uh, Michael Hawley Day. How you doing, Mike? Great. Great. It's uh, snowing outside my window here in Buffalo, New York. Well, it does that all year, doesn't it? <laughs> huh. Feels like it. That's right. Yeah, you know, two, two months of summer. Yeah, chicken wings and snow. That's what we have here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why do they call them buffalo wings? You, you know. You know, that's what happens when uh, they're from Buffalo. <laughs> yeah, because you've got lots of buffalo there, don't you? Uh, yeah, that... Uh, no, no bison here. That's that's one of the misconceptions. <laughs> oh, come on. I mean, you know, anyway. Well, I'm not going to go there. I was going to get into trouble, but I'm not going to get to trouble today. <laughs> yeah, well, we've got a great guest, and he's uh, working on doing a documentary. So let's get him in and talk about this. Um, so, Dacre Stoker, thank you for coming on the show. Absolutely, Al. Thank you. And, uh, Michael, thanks for, for being here with us as we can chat all about you know, my great-granduncle Bram Stoker and how I'm trying to sort of shuffle the deck and show people something a little bit different about him than they've ever seen before. What exactly are you trying to put together here? You're trying to put together a documentary, and you've got some great people to work with here. Um, so maybe explain kind of um, what you hope to achieve with this documentary. So, um, you know, the, the point is I've been working on uh, better understanding my great-granduncle Bram Stoker for about 15 years now. I found all kinds of interesting documents that, that he uh, wrote, uh, letters, a journal, his Dracula typescript, the manuscript, uh, Dracula notes, uh, things that other people said about him, newspaper articles, and I, and I kind of pulled them all together. And I've used those to write two international bestsellers, a prequel to Dracula called Dracula and a sequel, uh, Dracula the Undead, and it published his journal. And I've also got involved with a buddy of mine, Chris McCauley from Edmonton, an Irishman living in uh, Edmonton. The yes. way, the way, no, the way far north, uh, Michael. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and we've done a range of games and audio stories, uh, video games, uh, board games, RPG games. But the, the last frontier, as far as I'm concerned, is, is film. And I, I had hoped, you know, putting in a lot of feelers, shooting a lot of pitches at different studios over the years, that somebody would pick up on some of some of the ideas I had about uh, a Bram Stoker documentary, and we got close a few times. Um, there was some interest raised, but you know, every you get to the final piece of it all, and you know, oh no, we just can't raise the money, or oh no, not at this time. So um, these two fellows that I met in, in when I was in Dublin, Ireland, at a film festival, Jason Figgis and John West, you know, we, we've been there so close, and we had great outlines, great ideas, and we just said, you know what? If this is going to happen, let's let's just do it ourselves. And if we have to raise a little money to do things like editing and so on, we'll we'll crowdfund. And that, and that's really where we are at. Al is is I've been able to on on travels to Transylvania, Scotland, where Bram wrote the novel, Whitby, where he was inspired and wrote his some of his notes, two places in Ireland, uh, to to have a couple of friends come along who have shot really good footage, drone footage. Um, you know, GoPro footage as we're walking into castles, stuff like that. So we didn't have to pay for a film crew to go do that. We've collected great footage. I mean, the cameras nowadays that you could, that a, a normal guy could use, pretty darn good if you know what you're doing. And, and Jason Figgis has all that. We've actually done um, the script already. I've, I've narrated, if you can believe it, you know, on my iPhone and sent it across to Ireland. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, you know, it, it's it's incredible what is available if you if you just have a you know a good you know microphone and so on. So we've got the concept down, we've got the basic idea, and and it just needs to all be edited with all the right still photos, and we've got 
friends of mine, the talking heads, who who are experts in the field in, in certain areas. And it's going to come together, at, you know. Um, but once you know, once we get the thing edited with with some money from Indiegogo, which starts in April. So the concept is to do something that no one's done before. Is is really to show a side of Bram Stoker. Uh, in a documentary, I mean, he appears in documentaries about Dracula or about vampires. You know, oh, Stoker, the Irishman who wrote this. But nobody really goes into depth into the events in his own life that were woven into the into the story, the actual research that he did, where did he get spe- very specific things that show up in the novel. So that's what we're aiming for, along with, you know, my two creative buddies, uh, Jason Figgis and John West. So, uh, Dacre, uh, Jason Figgis and John West I've been working with for about a couple years, and both are just amazing. I think uh, if one, anyone can do this with the Indiegogo, it, it, I'm, they can do it. So I've been just impressed with the, the stuff they've done already. So I'm excited about this. So just, I mean, jump in for a second, and Michael, tell me briefly what's your project, because I know there's some overlap. We, we had actually, Figgis had, had told me stuff he's working on, uh, but I didn't know you were actually involved in this. So, so yes. I mean, there's a crossover. It's Victorian horror kind of stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. What happened was is Jason uh, is friends with a mutual friend, uh, Stuart Evans. And, and so what happened is I've, I've been, um, I just finished my latest book on uh, Francis Tumbley, and the man that, the person that actually did the foreword is Neil Story. And by oh, the way, he yes. sends his best. Neil sends his best. Yeah, he did a great visual. A uh, biography of Bram. Yeah. And, and, yes. Uh, oh, what a small world. That's great. I know. It's a small world. And so then, so that uh, I've been finding, uh, it's amazing. Here's a Jack the Ripper suspect. And the question I always got was, well, if he truly was a serial killer, when Tumbley sneaked back to America, were there any murders, on, uh, Ripper-like murders on South? Honest to God, I found 39 where I can't eliminate him. Yeah. And then 37 assaults that match him. So, uh, so um, Jason wants to put that to film. And, and so, uh, the, so we are trying to do this as well. But, uh, so I, I think we're kind of like, uh, I'm, I'm a little one step behind you. So it won't be anything ready. Um, I'm actually hoping that you could get yours done. You were talking about maybe the Halloween time frame. That would be awesome. Yeah. Well, let me ask this for a moment, and, and, and Alan, you can weigh in here on what, what you may know about it. The connection between Francis Tumblety and Hall Kane, a great friend of Bram. Oh, who, yes. Oh, who yes. Bram dedicated Dracula to. I think there's definitely a crossover here, Michael, besides right. uh, us knowing each other and, and us and, and Figgis. So um, what, th- that's part. this is part of Bram's life. I mean, he I, had mentors in his life. He had people that saved his butt when he lost a lot of money on, on uh, not not very good, let's say, investments. Hall Kane, very famous writer at this time, right. uh, had made a lot of money, and he, you know, he came to help Bram from time to time. I've seen very interesting letters between the two yes. that that you know talk about uh, their quest to stop copyright infringements, plagiarism. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That, that that's interesting in, in itself when you think of you know copyright and and uh, Prana Films and Nosferatu, but we won't go there. Yeah. Uh, and also, um, Hall Kane wrote one of the the most incredible um, eulogy to Bram Stoker, a, a very in depth eulogy. Yes, right. Uh, and, and so, so yeah. What do you know about the connection between the, those three guys? Well, what happened is, is you know, it was the mid nineteen seventies when Francis Tumbledy finally started a, a an office in Liverpool, and that's how he met uh, Hall Kane first. But then. Uh, so uh, Neil Story had found some, had found some of these letters, and there was a photograph in there of, of uh, both Hall Kane and Francis Tumblety. Now, if you go to Wikipedia, the photograph of Tumblety in the, the Prussian helmet is not him. It's the one that Neil Story found. That's the actual photograph. Yeah. But what happened was is Hall, um, the Francis Tumblety himself said that he would visit the, the Beefsteak Club at the, the Lyceum Theater, and, of course, Bram Stoke, Bram, Bram, you know, uh, was That's there. That's his domain. <laughs> yeah. Yes, his domain. And and then uh, what had happened was is the Order of the Golden Dawn that was started there, you know, one of their goals was to get the Philosopher's Stone or the Elixir of Life. And that's what Tumblety's goal was. He even talked about this elixir. And there was actually a, uh, a theory that uh, that uh, this 
which the, a prominent engineer from the wealthy West End went to Scotland, uh, Scotland Yard and said that they're, it's a Jekyll Hyde type person they think Jack the Ripper was. During the day, he's a prominent physician. At night, he's a medical maniac looking for the elixir of life, mixing herbs with the fluids of the uterus. And t Tumbley was an herb doctor. And so uh, these connections with the, this elixir of life and then, uh, and then the, the Lyceum Theater. And then, of course, Tumbley had a passion for theater. And then uh, so, in the, and so there's always these, these, these close connections uh, with that. And that right that, there. So, and then here's Tum and, and Tumbledy was, a, uh, he was just, he was so enamored with youth and this elixir and what I, I even though I wrote in my book, The Ripper's Haunts, about that, I just found uh, a, uh, um, his uh, Baltimore attorney was saying that uh, it was under sworn testimony in around 1901, he's carrying around this flask of this brown stuff, and he's drinking it, oh it like a concoction, like an elixir. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. it just keeps on coming. So, yeah. Well, listen, for, for all the listeners, what, what you're, you're hearing are, are two guys who are so caught up in this, you know, the interesting intrigue of the Victorian era, and Bram Stoker was kind of an observer. And I'll just say this, because this is where we get back to our film for a moment, is the, the context of Bram Stoker's life. He moved from Ireland to work in the Lyceum Theatre. And when he came over here in, in 1878, things changed dramatically. He was in the middle of the intelligentsia, the, in the middle of the creative world. He had survived a seven-year childhood illness that he, where he was an invalid. He was able to become a champion athlete after doing lots of long-distance walking to get his health back, and he became a champion long-distance walker through Trinity College, as well as all-around athletics, rugby, rowing, all that stuff. But he also had to become a civil servant because the family needed some money as his dad retired. So imagine the creative guy that we're, we're talking about um, being kind of shoved into this role that he had to do for the good of the family and put aside his own desires to, to get into writing, to get into art, and to get into theater. And the way he survived is he did pro bono theatrical reviews. Um, but he also was promoted to become the inspector of clerks all over Ireland. And this is where it gets interesting, guys, because before he came to London, he was traveling around Ireland to the 30-some-odd counties by carriage and by train to go visit the different clerks and make sure they're all doing the right legal job. Doesn't that sound just a little bit like Jonathan Harker traveling all the way yes, across yes. Europe by train and then carriage to go and consummate the legal transactions that Count Dracula is doing? So even though this was not something Brand really wanted to do, he used that kind of stuff. Uh, his personal experiences when he was in sort of hostile ground to go check up on all these other clerks. And funnily enough, he found that they were doing such a terrible job, there was no continuity in, in, the, in, in sort of the uh, uh, handing out penalties and, and the law that he came back and told his boss, we've got to write a manual. And he says, well, go ahead, Bram Stoker, you write the manual. He wrote a legal manual called The Duties of Clerks of Petty Sessions that was in use until the 60s in Ireland. That's the type of Jonathan Harker guy he was. But to, to get back to where Michael and I are coming from, the Victorian era was full of very interesting, let's just call it occult times. To put it in perspective, the origin of the species was, was just written, and it was published in 1859, I believe. And Darwin had you know, made another, a lot of outlanders' claims, which was in conflict with, obviously, religion. So the power of religion was beginning to wane a little bit, the power over the people, and as the scientific world was beginning to pop up and go, wait a sec, there's, we need some scientific proof to prove these things that you're all thinking would happen. And then people start thinking really about spiritualism, and, and as we call today, paranormal investigation, mesmerism, tarot card reading, seance, all that stuff is, is moving around. And you mentioned the Order of the Golden Dawn. Bram was a Freemason. I don't have any proof that he was a, a, a donor, but he was, you know, in, in that world was very interesting to him. And I have found books 
And I found letters that he's written to sort of known occultists, people who were advanced thinkers that had to practice their trade or their, you know, their interests or talk with other guys about this behind closed doors so they would not be uh, subjected, you know, to ridicule, especially a guy who is an upstanding theater manager. So just putting all this out here, uh, Alan, to sort of to, to tell your listeners, this is the, the landscape. Uh, that Bram Stoker was working in. The time was right to create a supernatural being. The time was right to be thinking about trances and Lucy's trance walk through Whitby, to have the brain control of Count Dracula on Mina when there was a blood exchange. The time was right to have science questioning, was Count Dracula an evil scientist who was forcing Renfield to eat different Forced, uh, forms of life to experiment. Uh, the time was right that mental patients, people with mental health problems, were usually shoved into prisons, but now they're put into asylums for hopefully better care. So there's a lot of kind of interesting social statements that Bram Stoker is making, as well as capitalizing on these sort of fears and worries uh, of people who are ready to read a book that, you know, Bram Stoker made seem real. And you, um, you say that um, the one and only interview of, uh, has been discovered with Bram talking about his writing of Dracula. Um, what, what can you tell us about that? Well, uh, I didn't discover it. I'm not sure who did, but it's been floating around. But it was by a Jane Stoddard in the British Weekly. Uh, and it was published just about three months after Dracula was published in uh, May 26, 1897. What's interesting, Alan, is we've seen other reviews of Dracula, but not interviews, which I am intrigued about. Um, so this one is the only place where someone actually says, and hey, Mr. Stoker, where did you get this idea? Or where did you come up with the vampire myth? And what we see is Bram Stoker admitting that the myth is something that's been going on for a while. It is very prevalent in many countries. He listed off 12 countries where he had found a treatise on, and we won't just say vampirism because it's you know any kind of revenant creature, souls of the undead coming out, malicious souls, they can sort of call them. Um, so he, he goes into detail in, in, in what he found in different places and that he's been interested in it for an awful long time, which makes me believe he may have picked up some of this stuff when he was a younger man living in Ireland. And I'll say this, that I've discovered in one of the books in his own library that his great-grandsons have, because I've been privy to my cousin's holdings, some of the books that they still have. One of them was written by Oscar Wilde's mother, Lady Jane Wilde. Oh, interesting. And wow. in it, she writes all about Irish superstition and folklore. And she actually wrote something close to these words, that Irish superstition is very similar to that of Transylvania, where they have their their versions of the vampires and the banshees and, and, and so on. And that they're ve these are very similar. They treat the dead in a similar fashion, these morning rituals where you have to do all kinds of things to make sure that the souls rest in peace. So that that could have been something that triggered Bram as a, as a younger man. And it also drew the connection to Madame Gerard, who is a Scottish lady who wrote a book called Land Beyond the Forest, and in it she had a uh, essay on Transylvanian superstitions that's referred to in this interview. So both the interview mm. refers to, to uh, Emily Gerard and this book by Lady Jane Wilde, and then, of course, the London Library made this discovery a couple of years ago, and I helped verify all this, had all 26 of the books that Bram listed in the back of his Dracula notes. Almost like he's doing a doctoral thesis. He, he lists his sources. You know, it's a book of fiction. You don't have to do that, but <laughs> he did it. He's that kind of persnippity guy. Huh. And in it, we can now read Transylvania Superstitions by Emily G uh, Gerard, who goes into absolute detail how to kill a vampire, cut the head off, put garlic in, steak it in a heart with a steak, all the things Bram used. So hmm. that interview, Alan, was sort of the, you know, the starting point that started, started me going towards the books he wrote, 
that were mentioned in Le Girard, London Library, it's like little pieces of a puzzle that all, you know, fit together. And once you, you know, might get three or four together, and boy, when you find that fifth one, in this case, the Lady Jane Wild book, it like made everything make sense. And, you know, in popular culture, you know, Vlad the Impaler, what was his connection with Vlad? Ah, so, again, there was a book in the Whitby Library and in the London Library, one by William Wilkinson and one by James Samuelson, and it mentions Vlad the Impaler being known as the devil. And that, I believe, was the connection. So you go back a little bit to what I said earlier about the occult. There were devil worshippers, you know, some of the very fringe, but there was devil worshipping going on. But there was also just the interest in the other, the other world. What's going on? You're good, you go to heaven, you're bad, you go to hell, and in between, you're in purgatory, that sort of thing. But Brad was interested in how people felt about the devil. What was the devil incarnate? What is he, what is he like? What would he be like if he came back as a, as a human being? And he finds somebody with a realistic backstory in Vlad the Impaler. So he starts reading up on him and connects that to Transylvania. Now, Vlad the Impaler was from Wallachia, which was a province in the south of Transylvania. Excuse me, south of Romania. Transylvania is, is just on the border, just above it. So Brand took license and, and moved Vlad the Impaler one state up and placed him in a you know, location where he needed to be, which is an extinct volcano. Why is that? Volcanoes were portals to hell, the home of the devil. So, question, how about, uh, how does Slane's Castle connect to this? Ah, good question. So, much like Bram merged Lad the Impaler with his devil, and also he took a little bit of Henry Irving playing the role of Mephistopheles, the devil, in the play Faust. So, <laughs> Bram was pulling bits and pieces of realistic experiences, historical characters, and superstition to make what he wanted, and that was his Count Dracula. He did the same with Castle Dracula. He saw two pictures of Bran Castle in near Brasov, which is the famous Castle Dracula, to, you know, they call it to this day, and then he, and, and he saw the picture in these two books where he wrote his description Harker comes up the castle and describes it a certain way. It, there's no question it is the sketches in these books, one by Bonner, one by Magicelli. That is what he's describing. But the interior, since he never went to Romania or stepped foot near Brand Castle, he actually wrote Dracula in Cruden Bay, Scotland, and he went inside it. And, and I've been inside it now. There is a hallway leading from the front door exactly the way he describes Jonathan Harker in Chapter 2, pulling up to the castle, going through a hall, entering into another room, an octagonal room lit by a single lamp with no windows to the outside. Guess what, fellas? That's exactly how Slane's castle is laid out. So he merged these two castles to make them feel believable, places that he'd been, places that he'd seen, to make his fictional castle. He just had to move it 400 miles to the north on this volcano. That Slane castle looks like in ruins now was it like that before no, or? no it's a good great question sadly um you, you know this sort of happened a lot in scotland and in parts of england mostly in scotland though where the the ruling class the earls um would would own all the land right and they would they would allow the people the farmers to farm it they'd pay them a rent for it after world war ii apparently when um international ship travel got much cheaper and the the uh, world was trading grain a lot easier and quicker the price of grains dropped in scotland and parts of england so that the value of this guy er, the, the earl of errol's holdings the bottom fell out and so he couldn't afford to keep everybody on he, he wasn't making any money he was losing money so what they do over there, which is really quite sad, is they, they might not sell the actual land, but they sell all the fixtures, the, the, the slate roof, the windows, the lead lining, the, the um, paneling, all the upholstery. And then once the roof is off of a ruin, you don't have to pay tax anymore because it's a ruin. So that's how the, the, the Earl of Errol, the family had owned it for 500 years, that's why they had to basically have a fire sale, and that's why oh. it is what it is today. 
Did they sell the light? <laughs> oh, I can't believe you asked that because <laughs> I was I was doing a presentation in the Kermonic Arms Hotel, which is the same hotel Bram was in. It's been renovated a number of times. It's beautiful. I was doing a presentation with my buddy Mike Shepard, who's a local guy in, Cr in Cruden Bay. He's an author. He's done great research in the area. I'm really beholden to him. He's got pieces that are going into this film as well. So he and I were giving a talk. The whole town came. I mean, it was really incredible to have you know, 250 people squeezed in this thing because they wanted nice. to hear the Stoker relative talking. And I was, I was kind of nervous because, you know, when you're, you're, you're in that area, it would be like if I go to Buffalo and I start telling people about how to make buffalo wings, you know, <laughs> I, I better be on my game, right? And then someone's going to go, now, wait a sec, where the hell are you from? So I'm talking about the octagonal room, and I'm reading this piece of Dracula, and lit by a single lamp, a man gets up in the back. <clears throat> I am Robert Hay. That's my family that used to own the castle. I own that lamp. That lamp. <laughs> Everybody turned and looked. I mean, this is he is still the aristocracy. He is really well dressed. He had some of his members of his family with him. And Mike and I, I think our faces probably dropped like, oh, geez, did we say something wrong? He was thrilled to death, but he said, when my family was separating everything, I really wanted that lamp. I remembered it as a kid. And so he's got the lamp hanging in his house in Chelsea in London, and he sent us a photograph. Wow. That, that's going to be in the documentary. <laughs> how cool, so how cool is that? You get yeah. lucked into things like that, don't you, sometimes? I got lucky to ask that question. The, the, uh, so did, uh, so, so Bram saw that lamp, likely. Yep. He, he would have, yeah, he, we, we believe there is no guest book at the, at the Slade's Castle. There is a guest book at Kimonic Arms Hotel that Bram signed. And Mike has said, listen, there's no question a celebrity like Bram Stoker being the manager of Lycee Theater for the famous Sir Henry Irving. There's no question he would not have been at, uh, invited to Slane's Castle to meet the Earl and have drinks with him. As a matter of fact, I found an article a number of years later where Bram was invited on a shooting party, you know, pheasant shooting, with the Earl of Errol. So there's ah. no question he went inside, even though he didn't have to write in his notes, you know, on my visit to Slane's Castle, <laughs> I noticed this. I think I'll use this for Jonathan Harker walking in. Right. But it's really cool because as Mike Shepard found a photograph of the front door of Slane's Castle, the way Bram described the front door with no knocker is exactly the same way as he described Harker going into Castle Dracula, no knocker, you know, boom, 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 you have to hit your hand. So I think Bram was reenacting kind of his feelings, maybe a little bit intimidated to walk up to the, the big castle and knock on the door because he's been invited in and maybe there was chains rattling, who knows, but... He would have seen that lamp. And I have seen photographs in the Edinburgh um, archives of what that room looked like with incredible artwork, beautiful paneling, and, and uh, rugs and things. It, it was really quite something. It was, you know, in the heyday, that was, that was the place to be. Wow. You know, one thing I noticed in, in the notes that, so now Bram toured the U.S. eight times, and uh, he came into contact with Buffalo Bill Cody, and there was a relationship there. Sounds like he really had a rich life here. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'd imagine this is also the time he must have picked up about the, the vampire scare in New England in the 1800s. He must have learned about it probably while he visited. Maybe I'm wrong, but. No, you, you absolutely. I mean, listen, you're more than right. There was a newspaper article in his notes about that New England vampire scare. <laughs> And, and, and I believe, because it was dated, I think it was September of 1896, and, the, and he was still writing Dracula. It wasn't published until May of 97. There was two, and remember, this article is stuck in the back of his notebook. So it's there. The question is, did he take anything from it and use the novel? And I'll say, Alan, absolutely. There was a reference to Charles Darwin mentioning when I was in South America, these large bats came out of the trees and drank blood out of, out of the cattle. 
he discovered the vampire bat on this trip. And it's mentioned in the novel, because, excuse me, in the newspaper article, because what the article is all about is the tuberculosis outbreak in New England being sort of misunderstood as a vampire scare because people who moved to New England from the old country kept these superstitions with them. But the parallel the writer was doing was saying, ooh, maybe there's a connection to these vampire bats. So what Brand did was almost word for word when Quincy Morris, the American, was in attendance with the other band of heroes and Van Helsing is trying to explain to Dr. Seward, the, the scientist, Listen, you've got you to believe what's going on. You may not be able to explain why this Lucy is losing all this blood overnight. We've given her tra a transfusion before she went to sleep. We come in the next day. She's pale. There's no blood lying on the ground. What the heck is going on? And Quincy Morris said, oh, when I was in South America, these big bats would come out of the trees at night, and one drank so much blood from my favorite horse, my favorite mare, I had to put her down. So that's... That's what he got out of that. I think the other thing he got out of the article is I think, I'm lucky. I'm going to sell a lot of books in America if in 1890 they're still believing this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the, you know. And, and so, and what about his uh, relationship with Bill Cody then? How, it, it seemed to last a long time. You said that he helped bring him to the U UK in the Wild West show. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, first of all, Henry Irving came with Bram. Bram was the lead man came over a number of times, set up everything, all the logistics, all the train travel. I've actually found, and this will be in the documentary, a map that Brand drew on to show all the train routes and how long between each city because he was responsible to not only get Henry Irving and Ellen Terry into a nice car and off to the hotel, but they traveled with 100 people from the Lyceum Theater, set designers, painters, costume guys, everything. So it's a massive logistical nightmare. So... Irving was really popular. He was a showman himself. And when they met out west, I think in Wyoming somewhere, they met Buffalo Bill Cody, there was immediate sort of connection because they recognized an equally incredible showman. And he, he had an incredible show. And they said, look, you, we're going to help you come to, uh, come to the U.K. So on, on this same trip when he got the newspaper article from the New York um, – New York world, they were out on, I think, Coney Island and saw the Wild West show again. And they said, look, we're, we're going to help you make arrangements. We've got people over here in Edinburgh, in Glasgow, in London. And they just made all the right connections and helped get, get them over and promote them. But it goes a step further, Alan. Again, it's the, it's the tendency of my great grand uncle to take things that are real, Vlad the Impaler, Castle Dracula, Slane's Castle, these ideas of superstition and things floating around different countries where people really believe the spirits of the dead come out. He took the attributes of Buffalo Bill Cody, who, who he admired, a brash American, Quincy Morris. That's where he got sort of the persona of this guy with a gun and the cowboy hat, but also his slang, use of slang language amongst the, you know, the, the very well-to-do British uh, lady, Lucy. And, um, he also used Buffalo Bill as a basis for two other characters in his novels. One is a guy called Elias Hutchison in um, a, a short story that Bram wrote called The Squaw. I turned it in with Christopher McCauley, who you and I have chatted before about uh, and with, uh, into a graphic novel called The Virgin's Embrace. And Elias Hutchison is in a, a brash American from the West part of the country, very much like Buffalo Bill, who goes to Nuremberg to see the scary sights, the, the Nuremberg Castle with all of its torture devices and, and bad stuff happens. So that's character number two that's Buffalo Bill Cody morphed into what Bram needed. And number three, uh, I don't think Bram quite understood the significance when he wrote Shoulder of Shasta and had a, uh, an American uh, sort of mountain man named Grizzly Dick uh, as the uh, sort of the uh, protagonist to, to meet up with this um, British lady who needed to leave uh, musty England because of her allergies and asthma and come to the uh, American West that's much drier. And so she met up with the unfortunately named Grizzly Dick, who was another 
sort of morphed cr- uh, character of uh, Buffalo Bill Cody. So that's right. that's his connection. And besides getting him and all of his crew, the Indians and the horses, onto ships, I've seen a picture of them all over, and were major big hits in the UK for a number of years. Right. That happens to be Michael's uh, name as well, Grizzly D. Big name? Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, but that's I a wear... different story. <laughs> On a good day. On a good yeah. day. That's yeah. right. <laughs> you, now you're going to come in uh, cover a lot of his life too, right? Because he was one of seven children, you know, and his family sounded very, you know, how do you say, you know, female right activist, doctor, civil servant. Like you, you've got all these different characters, and and also he was religious too, but yet covered the occult. And you're going to talk about his sexuality and his marriage and all that stuff. There's a lot of things going on in his personal life as well, isn't there? There is, and that, that's, you know, you, you sort of, I don't want this to be some just sort of sort of boring, this is the way he was type thing. Right. It's like we right. want people to subtly see the kind of man that emerged from this very interesting family, you know, three doctors, my great-grandfather being one of them, three scientists, civil servants, you know, not the most creatives, and here's Bram, the one creative that has the guts to start writing even when his father is kind of pushing him to become a clerk in the Petty Sessions legal department. He also helped start the Dublin Painting and Sketching Club. So what Jason and John and I have figured out is we need to create these subtle moments where the viewer can better understand Bram through his thoughts and words and actions rather than just me being the narrator saying, well, he was a complex young man and he, and he was troubled because of this. Or people have misinterpreted, in my opinion, the letter he wrote to Walt Whitman that was bearing his soul uh, uh, about Whitman's writing, his, his sort of avant-garde writing and his freedom of writing, and it's proof that Bram Stoker was, you know, bisexual or something. You know, that just, I don't want to jump into all that and refute things that have been said with no basis. I want to present Bram as a very interesting, deep-thinking person and where these ideas came from and, and really let people, you know, draw conclusions. But between John and I doing the the narrate or the, the script and me doing the narration, we'll put some we'll put obviously facts out there. But the whole idea is it's 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 done in a way that a subtle way that the viewer of of the documentary will will I think come to a conclusion as I've done that Bram was a very interesting and complex guy. And you know, it's kind of sad he dies. In 1912, that he hasn't seen success of his book um, on stage or anything else. I mean, it, he knew it was successful as a novel, but he didn't really know what happened to it after that. Right. How how did the community, how did the area, and even the UK, how how did people um, receive a book like Dracula at that time? How was it? How was it thought of? Well, let me throw this name at the two of you guys. We'll play a little word association for a moment, because I find it interesting, and I bet you Michael has dealt with this doing work in Victorian era. If I said the word to you guys, sensational, what does that mean back in 1897 versus what it might mean today? Any, any ideas that worth a, a little chat? The sensational as in uh, what the newspapers were trying to do with the sensationalism, is something to that effect? Yeah, in other words, the reviewers said in many cases this novel was of a sensational matter, far too sensational for our, you know, uh, our sensitivities at the moment. That that's the context. So mm. it, it was sensational and um, to some extent far too far too over the top for people to mm. to, to, to get. Right. Yeah, I, that's how I would have figured. I, you know, I um, b- b- because what what were people living like then, and what were they thinking? And if there were fears where people were actually scared of vampires and stuff, there must have been a. Did they have a, a weird impression of who Bram was then? Well, he kind of had two sides to him, and that's what freaked people out. He was the very upstanding theatrical manager. You know, all the books were just right. The money, the the organization, everything. He was very straight and narrow when it comes to running the theater. But this mystical, Irish mystical writer side of him exposed a whole other side, Alan. This sort of, and somebody wrote, actually it was New York Times, 
I won't get it right, but uh, <laughs> I, I love to read it every now and then when I'm on a stage to, to, to people. It's his obituary, and it was there was a touch of Celtic mysticism in Bram Stoker, and he wrote <laughs> about it with passion, almost like it was inviting us to understand or try to understand what was going on in his mind. And that's the side that he shows, but not that much in his writing. That's the side Figgis and Stoker and West are going to try to show hmm. in this documentary. Question, Digger. Um, being Irish, I was auto automatically assuming that he was Irish Catholic. But was, was he? What were? No. Great question, Michael, because that, that's another piece of, you know, you're in the minority as an Irish Protestant. Uh, he went to Trinity College, which was mostly Catholic. Uh, he, he, you know, it, he was a religious man, obviously marrying the church in those days. You obviously that was right. But when you really think about Dracula and the fact that the church was losing its kind of stranglehold of absolute power, he still recognized the, uh, the, the religious overtones using the crucifix, the wafer, the holy water. But he was also pushing the fact that amongst all the other beliefs that man may have in religion and superstition, he must have faith in goodness and in fellow man to overcome the dark side. And that's what I get from analyzing his spirituality, his religion. Now, at the end of Dracula, um, how it ended in the movies and the shows and, and even the, the final book, uh, was the original manuscript different, had a different ending? Is that true? Absolutely. That was something that I gleaned from uh, a few hours in Seattle, Washington, with the Paul Allen per had purchased. He's the Microsoft co-founder of uh, um, Dracula Manuscript. And since it's typed, we, some of us call it a typescript, I found that the first 102 uh, pages were cut out. Actually, 101, because it started on page 102, but also the ending was cut out. Hmm. And that this is another thing that we, we talk about because it brings everything full circle. I talked about 20 minutes ago about the devil, about why Bram's notes that live in Philadelphia mention certain very specific coordinates that lead Jonathan Harker and us, the researchers, to a, 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 an extinct volcano in the Kalamani National Park called Mount Israel. Well, that was an extinct volcano. The original ending of Dracula that was crossed out I believe, by Bram's publisher, because he didn't want a definitive ending, included right after the Band of Heroes fight off the gypsies, rip open the, the crate, and slit the Count's neck, and then uh, the, the American, uh, Quincy, stabs the Count with his bowie knife, not a stake, and the Count crumbles into dust. Right after that happens, which is now cut out of the, of the typescript, and it doesn't appear in any novels, the massive volcano erupted. And when it erupted, Castle Dracula comes down and crumbles down. The, the, the good guys get away somehow, uh, and the gypsies all take off. And, of course, we don't know exactly what happens to the Count because he's crumbled into dust. Had that, um, you know, that, that volcano actually erupted, it probably would have given the impression to the reader that Count Dracula is actually destroyed. Hmm. But a less ambiguous ending is now an apparent because it's, you know, no volcanic eruption, and the Count may be escaped by crumbling into dust, leaving the door open for Dracula to live on 127 years later, and he keeps popping up in films and screaming, and even his great-grandnephew writes a prequel and a sequel about it all. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing, actually, you know. Um, and also, I was reading this uh, discovery of the Icelandic and Swedish translation of Dracula, and it reveals a different preface. So what do you mean by that? Like, what's that all about? So if, if you open up, and any of your listeners open up a copy of Dracula, you'll see that the preface is about a paragraph long. And it, too, is a little bit ambiguous, but it leads you to believe that Bram is saying, there's a realistic element to this story. But the preface that's been discovered and has been sitting in Iceland in a published book since 1901, and it was up until 2015 that Hans de Roos, a buddy of mine, who's a fellow researcher, we've traveled together and dug into stuff together, he, tra he translated not just the preface, because a guy called Richard Dalby did that in 1989 and found that the preface 
was very convincing that the story was real. And as Michael will enjoy, it actually mentioned in the story the Jack the Ripper murders. Oh. Yes, sir. But we'll, <laughs> but we'll come into the story a little later. So for some reason, that is different. But as DeRus and others, and myself included, have analyzed the Swedish book and the Icelandic book, they were all published in newspapers before they were published as a novel. And, and now what we believe is the newspaper editor customized or edited the story to make it a little more, let's say, gruesome, a little more sexual, and a little bit more appropriate to scare the heck out of people in their country because it included a lot of political fascism. Uh, it included Count Dracula looking a little bit more like a political leader coming to London to wreak havoc rather than drinking blood from fair maidens. And he doesn't die at the end of the story like the Count Dracula Bram story. So, Alan, it throws, you know, this puzzle that I'm talking about. It is, you know, a Swedish piece, an Icelandic piece, but it's a piece that has not been confirmed. It's just adds to the Dracula soup that's like, this is a mystery. We may not ever answer it. Pretty fascinating, you know, the whole story, his whole life. Um, it's, just, it's just amazing. So what is it you're hoping that uh, people can do to help out with the documentary? Well, if, if you enjoyed listening to our, our chat, and I certainly have, um, you know, if you'd like to see this become a reality, uh, April 1st, uh, Indiegogo, uh, the art campaign, The Father of Dracula, goes live and get in there and contribute. Um, the, these things, as you know, in crowdfunding, um, end up you, you end up with little rewards here and there. But mostly, you know, in, in our case, it's like, yeah, we give out books and signs of stuff, but we just need the money to get Fick, Jason Figgis into a high-end um, a, a studio to edit all of the work that's already been done. I mean, everything else out of our own pocket, we, we just need some help to get it edited, and then hopefully it will show up at film festivals, it might get on the streaming networks, who, who knows where, you know, it's just the, the success of the work that we've all done, if it gets picked up, then it'll appeal to a broader audience, rather than just having to stick it on YouTube, but there's nothing wrong with that, but we'd, we'd like to get it to, you know, into into other places before we, we, we go that route. Right. And Jason, Jason is award-winning, award he's, he's, he's quality. Yeah, no, yeah. Like, I just got to say, before we end this, the Sir Simon Marsden film that he did with, yes. I mean, absolutely incredible. That's what hooked me to Jason Figgis years ago, was the sensitivity about this, this uh, a, a famous uh, photographer who was knighted for his ability to kind of show the gothic sensitivities of the potential of ghosts. Very, yeah. very interesting. And that's give me the vibe that, that I felt that he could do also with my great grand uncle, and that's why I hooked up to his team. Well, fantastic. So let's let's talk about. Uh, do you have contact information, or do you have where where should people go also to find out more? Well, you can go to dakerstoker.com. dot um, I don't have a page yet on that for Father Dracula. You can also follow me uh, on Facebook, Daker Stoker Author, and then the Bram Stoker Estate. Dot com is a website my wife and I run. We put lots of information about the family there. And if you ever want to read any of Bram's books for free, here is your, your free advice today. Bramstoker.org, as opposed to Bramstokerstate.com, .org has all of his free stuff. So there's some, there's some free info, places to follow me. And if you follow me or Jason Figgis or John West on Facebook or um Instagram that we'll be updating people about exactly how the campaign's going. But you go to Indiegogo, April 1st, Father of Dracula, uh, all the info will be there for you. Well, fantastic. Well, appreciate you being here and coming on and talking about all this and wish you the best. Yeah, well, it's, great. It's, it's the right place to be, the House of Mystery, guys. And I thank you for <laughs> your time, your interest. And uh, Alex, we haven't chatted for a while, but thank you for connecting. And Michael, it's about damn time we did connect. So good that luck with right. your project too, buddy. <laughs> thank you, and it's awesome talking with you. Thank All you. right, guys. Take care now. This has been a production of the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our show, guests, or hosts, go to our website at houseofmysteryradio.com.